So you wanna play Bloodborne? Nice, cool, you got it. It was just free on PlayStation Plus, so my guess is there's a lot of new people ready to give this bad boy a try. Everyone, and that includes me, says this game is great. It may seem like a terrible idea, but much like stumbling into a cult while they're passing around the Kool-Aid, at some point you just gotta say fuck it and be a sheep. This might be your first Souls game, and I get it. They're hella intimidating. All of the memes and jokes about these being the hardest games ever made, you gotta admit, it's kinda off-putting. It's even on the box! You really don't sell yourself well, do you, bud? But hey, the game's free. What do you gotta lose? Just pop it in and- Right off the bat, nothing makes sense. The story is just vague mumblings and creepy ramblings. Right bet, you'd be surprised if I told you that the game did have side quests that you definitely missed. There are RPG elements, but you'd have a better time finding out where all the socks went in your house than understand how to properly level. You'll start up a game and be left with nothing but questions. But don't worry, cuck. Just play the game and everything will be explained. No, I'm kidding. You're not gonna learn shit. Aside from being hard, this game doubles down by its lack of hand-holding and tells you diddly squat. That hand that once held yours just pulled back and smacked you across your Pillsbury dough face. Some stuff you figure out through trial and error, but like trying to find a light switch at night, it involves a lot of bruises. There is just so much that you'd only know by looking stuff up online. Luckily for you, I'm a jaded man with access to Wikipedia and a platform to yell on, and I'm willing to transfer all that knowledge oh, onto yeah. you! So if we're gonna do this guide right, we're gonna have to start at the beginning. So boot up your game, hit play online because you have high self-esteem and there is nothing wrong about playing with friends, and BOOM! Your first obstacle in this obscene world. No wait, that's just a character creator. Carry on. Been looking pretty snazzy though. But what's on the next screen? BOOM! There we are! Your stats! What do they mean? And what do they do? <laughs> Before you just start picking numbers at random, like your teacher's coming around to collect homework that you didn't do, there isn't any respec in this game, so unlike Mass Effect, your choices matter. Let's quickly look at the symbols and see what they do. Vitality, that's your health. Endurance, that's your stamina, which unlike Skyward Sword, holds a purpose for being in the game. Every attack, dodge, and run uses stamina, so managing it is a core part of the game. Now these next two are tied to what kind of weapons you want to use. I'll put up on screen which weapon goes with each, but for a good rule of thumb, if you want a heavy, slow moving, but hard hitting weapon, think like Sloth from the Goonies, you want to go into Strength. But if you want a weapon faster than that one time your dad bolted and never came back, you want to go into Skill. Skill deals less damage, but means you'll be able to hit the enemy more often. Skill is also the only stat tied to Visceral attacks. This cool move! The more skill you have, the more damage this move does, which is awesome. I'd recommend a straight skill or strength build if this is your first Souls game, or you don't feel super confident about your abilities. Mix builds work, but you're going to be taken away from your health or your endurance, which, much like Thin Mints or the time of day, you're always going to wish you had more of. Arcane here helps up with your spells and items like Fire Paper and the Choir Bell, and yes, you can use magic in this game but good luck finding it. It's also tied to your luck, apparently a superpower if you're Master Chief. So the higher your arcane, the better chance you'll get better goodies from dead enemies. But that being said, an arcane build really isn't recommended for beginners because of the lack of spells early game. Blood Tidge here is related to your guns or your weapons that use bullets. These can be made into very powerful builds, but again, are extremely hard to get going throughout most of the game, and don't truly shine until almost endgame, so not really recommended. Each stat has what's called the soft and the hard cap, which are the walls of diminishing returns. I think the best way to explain this would be, when you start leveling, let's say you put in one point into strength, that'll turn your 100 attack weapon into 110 attack, but at a certain point, you won't get plus 10 attack per level, instead you'll get plus 5 attack per level. Well, you just reach the soft cap, and the hard cap in turn means you'll gain even less. You'll get like plus 1 attack per point. 
so you don't want to go past the hard cap, and it's better spent on something else. Cool? Got it? Awesome. Let's move on. So decide what kind of build you want, pick that personality, and let's get this started. Now welcome to the world of Bloodborne. It may seem super scary, even downright terrifying. I mean, just look at this thing. Ew. Get a job! But what I'm about to tell you may just change your life. Unless it's an obvious boss, there really isn't anything in the game you can't run away from. <laughs> That's right, make enemies check out your glutes as you gallivant into the moonlight. Now, you should fight things to get better at the game, but sometimes you just don't want to empty room after room again and again and again. You got shit to do, and this game can't tell you how to live your life. Maybe you just died from a boss. I don't know, I'm not your dad. Just turn tail. No one's gonna make fun of you. Loudly. And if anything, it'll probably just help out your dodging skills. Maybe make noises so your constant retreating is at least somewhat redeemable. No, actually you just made it worse. So let's not get too ahead of ourselves now, shall we? We need a weapon. Once you find a lantern, or die, whichever comes first, probably the latter because again, read the box, you'll be entered into the hunter's dream, and it's time to pick out a weapon. Like any Pokemon wannabe, you'll have three to choose from, each tied to a build, skill, strength, and undecided. Obviously, you want to pick whichever one you decided from your build earlier, but never be afraid of the saw cleaver. Much like an easier mom joke, it's always a good choice. Now let's decide on a gun. We have two options, shotgun or pistol. Now you may be like, mm, you sitting there to do a blood tinge build, I don't really care about the gun then. Mm. Well, remember this move from a minute back? Yeah, the cool one. I'm gonna show you how to do it. When an enemy is about to attack you, and has wound up his method of which to turn you into pudding, you're gonna shoot that sucker right in the face, and you'll hear the more satisfying sound since coffee brewing. No, it doesn't control my life. Nobody asked you! Shut up! That sound, my friend, is the terror. Once they're on their knees, walk on up and press R1 for that groovy visceral attack. Who doesn't want to do this move? So you're gonna need a gun. The blunderbuss shoots many pellets in a spread, so you'll have a better chance of hitting that parry if you miss your shot. But the pistol, on the other hand, fires much faster than the blunderbuss. So it's kinda like butt sex. It all just comes down to the amount of shit you're willing to put up with and personal preference. I always go with the pistol, cause I can never get the timing right for the blunderbuss. Now that you're armed to the teeth, I got a bit more explaining to do. Much like trying to differentiate the weight between a freighter truck and your mom, there's that your mom joke I was talking about, we're gonna need to learn about scaling. If we go back to a weapon here, you'll notice a couple things. You see it? Right? Of course not. This screen, much like Facebook at the moment, is an absolute mess. Why are the numbers and letters? If you look over here, each weapon will have attributes. The requirements just mean the skills needed to wield it. But much like the Count trying to experiment, what we're concerned about are the letters. That is the weapon's proficiency. Let's use the threaded cane as an example. So right away, you're going to see that it has an E in strength, a C in skill, and a D in arcane. Each letter has a percentage assigned to it. That shows how much percentage of the weapon's base damage you're going to get. The threaded cane has a C in scaling, which is 45-60% to 60 of your base damage. Quick math says, our base damage is 78. Take that C scaling of 45% and that gives us an extra 35 damage to your weapon. Each weapon can be leveled up 10 times. Each level, your proficiency percentage goes up. So an unleveled threaded cane will have 45% proficiency, but a plus 1 will have 55, and maybe at plus 2 it goes to 65 and turns that C scaling into B scaling. Unfortunately, we can't see the actual percentages in game, just the letter. But there are a lot of sites and online calculators if you really want to know. Some weapons have dual attributes, like both a B in skill and strength. These are called quality weapons. The scaling applies to both stats, so you can get a percentage bonus from each. That may sound like the best thing ever, but to get the most out of your weapon, you're going to want to hard cap some stats. So to do that, for both skill and strength, you either need to get to level 200, or like I said before, sacrifice your health and endurance. 
You may have also noticed that almost every weapon scales with arcane, but much like the Nigerian prince that needs your credit card info, it's just a trick. Kinda. Even if you see a D in arcane, you're only getting a percentage of your weapon's arcane damage, which for most weapons is zero. 30% of zero is still zero. That arcane does have a purpose though. When you're deep into the late game, you'll find gems that will add arcane damage to your weapons. But for early game purposes, unless you're dead set in an arcane build, I would just ignore it. Got that? I know it's a lot, and I didn't expect you to do math. It's my own video and I'm already slightly bored of numbers. <coughs> Anyhow, if you're in need of blood vials early on, here's a nice little trick for you. First, clear out this room. Kill this fool, and then get the attention of these scary wolves. Hey wolves! Look at me when I'm talking to you! Then do a 180 faster than Battlefront 2 stance on loot boxes and run back into that room. These stupid wolves may strike fear and terror into you, but they ain't shit. Meet your new best friend, Invisible Walls, used for all your early game exploits. You can even kill Evelyn the Crow with your new bestie. So these bad puppers can enter. So just make sure you don't get too close to the wall. Take your time. They should drop about three blood vials each. Once lifeless ragdolls, you'll see that Solomon Grundy looking motherfucker. He also drops three blood vials. Get his attention, do the same thing. Now, with your hefty amount of souls and nine new blood vials, rinse and repeat, and you should have plenty throughout the game. All right, I think you're prepared now. Give yourself a pat on the back and a gold star, because this is where the fun begins. The bosses. All of your training has come down to this. It's time to fight the first boss in the game. Now, this is what Bloodborne, and any Souls game for that matter, is all about. The bosses. The ambience of the rotting streets swells into an epic orchestra. The size and the sight of the monster at first terrifies you. But as soon as that health bar shows up, that fear turns into adrenaline, and the music gets louder, and the beast roars, beckoning you, and you roar back at your screen! Bring it on! Man, I love this game. So this will be the first real roadblock for new players. But before you throw your hands up in the air and yell, Cheap! Unfair! Game sucks! Too hard! This is an extremely important and pivotal part of the game. Not story-wise. Maybe story-wise? I have no idea what the Cleric Beast means lore-wise, but it probably has something to do with Lawrence. DAMN YOU LAWRENCE! But gameplay-wise, the Cleric Beast, for all intents and purposes, is the ultimate tutorial. Maybe even harder than Cuphead's tutorial. Let me explain, and in turn, you'll learn how to beat him. I could easily say, Yo, GG, get good scrub, and be done with it. Toss my drink in the air, and make you clean it up for backtalking me. But let's skip that part and break down a little bit what to do here. If you were like me and ran past a lot of this stuff, this would be your first real enemy that you'll need to lock onto. Even when fighting other enemies, you can get pretty far without locking on. But this fight, ha, think again, this ain't no baby game, object permanent is everything, cause if you can't see this giant monster, you're about to be deader than Harvey Weinstein's career. <laughs> Next of all, all of his moves are extremely choreographed. Everything he does, he gives more than enough fair warning for. This teaches players to observe and recognize patterns, and learn when he's most vulnerable. It may just seem like crazy flailing dedicated to your doom, but it's not. Just watch and see what the creature does. We can also look at the creature to determine from how it looks what's dangerous. Mainly for this fool, his one big burly J.O. arm. It's like if Chewie and that one guy from Lady in the Water had a baby. So we gotta avoid Jill. How to dodge properly. The Cronenberg lamb over here is gonna slowly wind up and swing his arm. And now, the learning begins. If you stand in the way of the swing, death. Okay, cool idiot, A for effort. Let's try rolling next time. So, he's swinging from right to left, so you decide to roll left. You're gonna beat the swing. Whoa! Wrong again. You're dead. The swing was too fast. Okay, something different. You're gonna try rolling away. You were just hitting him, and you notice that wind up just a little bit too late, and nope, ugh, you're dead again. Jeez. Ugh. Eesh. 
Yikes. Ooh. Now, you may be getting a little bit frustrated, but there are only so many options. So he swings from right to left, and what do you do? You dodge right and voila! You're alive? But, but why? You rolled right into the arm. How? You, my friend, just learned about iframes. What are iframes? My eagerly, probably tired of me over explaining stuff you probably already know, viewer. Well, iframes, or invincibility frames, are times when your character is invincible and can't take damage, be stunned, or anything. So in this game, when you roll or dash, for 11 frames, you can't be hit. 11 frames isn't long at all. You wanna see how fast that is? That's it. So, you gotta make the most out of it and learn how to time your dodges. Now, a way I see people rage a lot is not understanding what recovery time is. So let's break down a roll. You start your roll from this point to this point. Between then, you can't be hit. But slightly after the roll, your character has to stand back up before he or she can roll again. This period is called the recovery period. It's fast, but these are not iframes and you can be hit during this phase. So how do you make your iframes count? 11 frames, again, is nothing. Most attacks last longer than that. That's why you gotta speed up your time of whatever is in your hitbox and roll into it. This works for anything in the game from gunshots to magic and anything else dangerous aimed at your person. Speed, fast, aggressive, Rah! Now, Dark Souls 3 definitely did speed up some things, but hide behind a shield and waiting for an opening isn't gonna work for you here. You don't get a shield in this game. Do you know what you get? A gun. That's your shield. Deal with it. Bloodborne forces you to be the aggressor. Hit first. Dodge fast. Become the beast. You move like they do. This has been Lessons with the Cleric Beast. He does seminars Mondays and Wednesdays and TED Talks on weekends. Now let's say you didn't beat the fool. Or you did and you're eager to go on to the next boss. But you want to do it with a friend. There's a good chance your friend also bought Bloodborne because it was just free on PlayStation. So. You aren't here to solo bosses. You want to work in hand in hand, buddies forever. But how do you go about doing that? Well, when you first encounter the first boss, your insight o meter goes up. Insight can be used for many different things like purchasing special items, changing things visually about the world around you, increases the rate at which you'll die of frenzy. But for all intents and purposes, we're gonna call them friendship tokens. You get friendship tokens by seeing a boss, killing a boss, and can be found throughout the world. Plentiful at late game, early on, you gotta make that insight count. Once you have at least two friendship tokens, you wanna go back to the hunter's dream and grab yourself the beckoning bell. Then you wanna mosey on over here to this pool and purchase yourself the resonating bell for one friendship token. Sick, now you're ready for some real co-op. Make sure your friend does the same thing, and then you're all ready to meet up. You want to find a place generally free of things trying to kill you. And if you want your friend in your game, you have to be the one to ring the beckoning bell. And your friend will ring the resonating bell. When you ring the beckoning bell, it'll consume one friendship token, but ringing the resonating bell won't. You can also use a password system to make sure that you and your friend only find each other. Now, preferably, you two should be standing in the same spot. And voila, just like that, it should work! So now that you know how to participate in Jolly Cooperation, and have learned the fundamental skill necessary to propel yourself through the streets of Yarnum, I hope you enjoy your adventure during the Night of the Hunt like I have so many times before. Hey guys, I hope this guide for the first part of the game was helpful. If you liked it, and want to see me cover other parts of the game that aren't explained well, because there's a lot of it, let me know. Leave a like or comment down below. Bloodborne is one of my favorite games of all time, and I'd love to make this into an ongoing series. Thanks everyone, I've been Bedhead, and again, happy hunting.